Yeah, hello. This is meeting number four of the Cycloj series about large language models. And today we'll have uh, Dimitri Kovny who will talk about transformer architectures. And in a moment, Dimitri will present uh, himself and the topic. Uh, maybe we'll just say that this series of, of, of meetups is mostly a closure series. And in the coming uh, sessions, we will dive more into the closure emerging stack of libraries around this uh, field of large language models. But today is mostly about this transformer architecture and Dimit will teach it through Python. At the end, we'll have a little bit of closure probably. And, and also maybe another comment is that uh, uh, this topic is of course, of course, uh, growing rapidly and and is uh, you know a bit problematic and 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 concerning in in different ways and and we have been thinking at the psychology organizing team about how we should address this topic which is uh, um, uh, not only a technical topic but also a social problematic topic of of uh, the emergence of ai and its uses and even though the psychology meetups will mostly be about the technical aspects, we are considering some broader perspective sessions that will be probably organized in another setting. And if anybody's interested in that, then please let us talk. And thank you to the people listening to this uh, recording. And Dimit, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and, and uh, say something about what you're going to speak about? Uh, thank you, Danny. Uh, so my name is Demid. Uh, I'm a data scientist. Uh, I work on uh, NLP problems uh, currently in the health domain. And uh, this talk was born a few months ago when I was asked uh, to implement uh, open AI APIs at work. And I started uh, making a more formal presentation, something with more details and also uh, expose the theory behind it and maybe i don't know uh, <laughs> maybe we will have, have some surprises regarding generative AI. so kindly pay attention okay uh, i'll present my screen so just a quick question uh, how many people here are familiar with large language models What do you mean familiar? Have we used them? Uh, used, uh, heard about them, uh, some level of familiarity. Some level, never used them, but kind of can explain what's behind them to non-technical people. Okay, uh, so I, I hope uh, uh, even the experienced people will learn something new from this talk. Um, I, I tried uh, not to dive too deep into the details, but to have it more high level and uh, but but but, uh, but to have enough of the theory to be able to talk about it <laughs> in an intelligent way. Okay. Okay, so uh, what do you think? Uh, how old is this field of generative AI? Fifty years. Fifty years. Okay, more. More question. More answers. Feel free to jump in. In the chat, uh, somebody says one. One. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't see the chat right now. So uh, uh, it's 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 a there's an option one. So one to ten years. Yeah, sorry, I didn't realize. Oh. It. Okay, more, uh, more opinions. Depends on what uh, you need. 
I'm definitely saying over 25 because I was working with neural networks 30 years ago. Okay. Okay, so we have uh, an interesting distribution here. And let me tell you what's uh, my belief. And I actually believe it's more than 100 years old. So you must be thinking I'm out of my mind. But please, before you send me <laughs> to the psychiatric ward, let me justify this very unusual take. So let's begin with a bit of history. Back in uh, 1913, uh, Andrei Andreevich Markov uses this, uh, uh, the one who is uh, of the Markov chain fame, uses a probabilistic model to analyze uh, Evgeny Onegin by Pushkin. Uh, he basically takes the first uh, 20,000 uh, words and analyzes them by hand. Next, in uh, 1948, uh, Claude Shannon, famous for information theory, applies the Markov chain to actually get a, a better generative model. And later we have uh, the first uh, neural network, the perceptron. And then uh, later in the 60s, we have the hidden Markov model. Okay. So in 1906, uh, Andrei Andreevich Markov presents this simple model of a Markov chain. Uh, is anyone here familiar with Markov chains? Yeah. Yes. Uh, would you like to tell us a few words? Uh, uh, this is, would be more, more of a dialogue. <laughs> I hate uh, speaking to myself, so feel free to jump in. So very sort of, uh, again, not, not terribly technical definition, but the idea is that you have a certain event that can follow other events and you give them probabilities. And then you basically can, you can generate events based on those probabilities. So if you're currently at the point A, with certain probability, you can end up in B, C, or D. So, or, or come back to A. And so you generate sort of these chains based on those probabilities, or you can study, you can look at the actual events and try to come up with a Markov model for it. Great, Th thank you, Elena. I'll just uh, add one more thing that uh, basically we have the more common property, which means we are not dependent on the past. Once we are in, we are in uh, state A or state E, it doesn't matter how we got there, okay? So that was in the beginning of the 20th century. And then in 1913, Markov publishes his very interesting work where he's taking the first 20,000 words of Evgeny Onegin and he treats each, uh, each letter as an event, a random event, which can be either a vowel or consonant. Yes, we'll discard uh, all other uh, signs and white space and so on. We'll just focus on the letters, okay? So let's define some properties. We, we, if we just uh, count the vowels, we'll get, uh, we'll get some probability, 0.4 or something. And we can also have uh, uh, the opposite, which is one minus, and that would be for consonants, that would be Q. And if we look one letter to the left of us, we can have a conditional probability. What would be the probability of a vowel once we already saw a vowel? That would be P1. And the same for a consonant. Okay, and we can actually uh, define this very nice table. And here we have the computer probabilities. And I have a question for you. Uh, based on the probabilities here, what do you think? Are these events really random? Or are they, uh, do they have, uh, are, are they independent? Or is there some dependence on the state before? So j j just to reiterate the, the column, uh, we have the, uh, on the column, we have the current state, which is either constant or well, 
and the row is the next state. Okay, again, also a constant interval. So, for, for example, the bottom right corner is the probability of the C of L after we already saw vowel in the current state. Then I think they are dependent. Yes, thank you, Danny. Would you like to elaborate? Yeah, we can see that after a consonant, there is a higher probability for a vowel, but after a vowel, there is a higher probability for a consonant. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. So th that was uh, Markov's conclusion. And he, in the, uh, if you read the original paper, which was also translated to English recently, uh, you can see his different calculations and estimations. And uh, basically, if you already, and he did all these calculations uh, by hand, obviously, <laughs> there were no computers then. Uh, so an interesting observation here is that if you compute uh, uh, P0, which means you're basically um, uh, in P1, you're basically counting the vowels. You don't need to count the constants because you can just do the reciprocal one minus, okay? So uh, I promised you that we are talking about generative I. So why am I bothering you with all these uh, <laughs> mark of chains from the beginning of the 20th century? Okay. so. I want to show you how can we can take this simple model and make it a generative AI or whatever other buzzword you'd like. Okay, so suppose we we're beginning uh, we're in the beginning, and BOS stands for beginning of sentence. So we toss this uh, coin, which is not a fair coin, but has uh, different probabilities for vowels and consonants, uh, P and Q, which is one minus P, and we get our first letter. From there again, we use our table using P1, P0, Q0, Q1, and so on to get the next letter based on conditioning on the previous one. And thus, we have a generative model for text. Okay, so uh, it's 110 years old and not very useful, but nevertheless, uh, I think uh, I gave some justification for my <laughs> very <laughs> surprising answer that it, uh, this field is more than 110 years old. So I hope uh, I managed to convince you of it. Okay, so this model is not very useful, just constant involves. But look what happens in 1948, okay? Claude Shannon, which is uh, in this very same uh, paper, a mathematical theory of communication, which later, because it became a seminal paper, was renamed to the Mathematica Mathematical Theory of Communication. It's a very interesting paper where he basically defines uh, entropy and bits and so on, everything we, we know now about information theory. And there he builds on Markov's work uh, to uh, basically build a more sophisticated model. Okay, now we are not just uh, concerned with uh, vowels and consonants, but we're looking at the level letter. Each, lever, each letter is a different state in our Markov chain, okay? So we can do different approximations here. For the zeros order, we can assume all the letters have the same probability. And if we sample from this model, if we generate text, we get something which basically looks random. However, if we go to the next uh, level and we use the actual frequencies, uh, read probabilities of each letter, we get maybe something which looks a bit more like English. And if we are uh, looking at the next level, uh, that, uh, basically d grams, uh, two grams, we're gonna get something better. And now, now, if we continue to the third order, it already looks a bit like English, okay? Then uh, basically Shannon uh, moves to the word level. No, we're no longer talking about letters, but uh, complete words. 
Then he does the uh, same model for first uh, order. And again, second order. Uh, would you say it's English? Mm, maybe a bit. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, we can use the same ideas of Cloud Shannon using modern hardware. So uh, this is uh, actually um, some segment from uh, someone who used an order six model on the works of Shakespeare. And uh, maybe someone would like to read it. Um, so just to be sure, all we do is approximate a six order Markov chain in the world level using Shakespeare data and exactly. then generate something random from that. Exactly. exactly. And we approximate it by, you know, in the naive way of counting, right? Counting uh, the different combinations and assigning probabil probabilities by these counts, right? Exactly. Yeah, thanks. No, I cannot read it, sorry. <laughs> Maybe one of the English native speakers would like uh, to jump in. No, okay. Uh, never mind. Okay, but uh, this looks uh, pretty much Shakespeare to me. Uh, I'm not an expert by any means, but uh, it, it looks very cool. So we have uh, a model from 1948. Uh, almost 100 years ago and it's a generative AI and it looks pretty good to me. So I hope I managed to convince you that uh, this field does have uh, an interesting history and it's not uh, it's just uh, some buzzword from the last years. Okay, um, let's, uh, let's move uh, forward in uh, 1943. Uh, there was this idea of a percep uh, perceptron, which was modeled after uh, human cognition, after the human brain. Uh, the concept uh, first appeared in 1943, and it was actually implemented on real hardware in 1958. So what, what do we have here? Uh, the eyes are just the inputs, and we have uh, one layer, uh, we're computing a weight for each input, summing everything, and then applying some activation function, okay? And during the training process, we are basically uh, can learning- you, Can you explain again what I2 might be, for example? Um, it, it could be, for example, uh, uh, some token, for example, a, le a letter, a word, and so on, okay? So what that, does it mean to multiply a token? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I didn't want to get into these details, but uh, basically we need some embedding. Uh, I, I don't discuss uh, embeddings uh, on this talk because otherwise it would be long, but uh, that's a good point, thank you. Yeah, so, thank we, you. So, so just to be sure, the eyes are numbers that yes. somehow represent the text, a, te a given text. Yeah, so for example, uh, we, we could uh, automatically take our sentence and uh, convert it uh, uh, to some embedding and then take uh, each component, uh, some vector, right? And take the individual components of the vector, uh, multiply them uh, by the weight, uh, uh, sum, and use the activation function. Okay, uh, what is, uh, before I move on, what could, and uh, do you know what was the problem with perceptrons? Uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, I don't see the chat. Um, so the problem is, uh, was a certain uh, pattern, which was called the XOR uh, problem. Uh, XOR stands for exclusive OR, which means it's either sunny or rainy, but not both, right? Um, so here you, you can see uh, on the left, you have the 
the case where uh, actually our perceptron was uh, able to separate between the hollow dots and the full dots, the white and the black ones, and also on the bottom ones, the and and the or. But the XOR function is not linearly separable. And unfortunately, uh, this kind of held back the this whole uh, AI neural networks field for some time. So this period was called the AI winter until uh, people realized that if you just add more layers to the perceptron, you can overcome this issue. So here we, uh, we have the multi-level perceptron, which has uh, many levels. And these are sometimes also called feed-forward uh, networks. Um, basically the same. Uh, we'll later see uh, RNNs, recurrent neural networks, and there we can we have such cycles. So that would be in contrast to uh, feed-forward uh, networks or just MLPs. Okay, let's continue our history lesson. So uh, we'll jump uh, to 1986 where uh, Rummelhart publishes uh, his uh, experimental report of back, back propagation. And this together with the computing power and the data sets uh, later in the 90s and the early uh, uh, 2000, that was actually the, the factors that uh, allowed this uh, deep learning revolution. And I also want to pay attention, uh, you to pay attention to these early works. Uh, first of all, a convolutional neural network by Jan LeCun. Uh, he applied it uh, to this data set of uh, handwritten uh, zip code information, which would later would become MNIST. And uh, a work by Schmidhuber that introduced basically uh, LSTMs, which is a kind of uh, RNN, recurrent neural network in 1995. And during the 90s and the early 2000s, there were many works about uh, RNNs and uh, the field was moving forward. But uh, the, actually the, um, the mainstream AI techniques, machine learning techniques were S SVMs. So let's talk a bit about recurrent neural networks. As uh, you can see, uh, they're recursive, recurrent, they have a cycles, uh, which basically means that uh, the axes are the inputs. The H stands for hidden layer. Uh, let me just go back a bit. Here in the, uh, in the perceptron, you can also see, for example, uh, this, uh, um, the inputs and um, in the middle we have the hidden layer and the dark green one is the output. So uh, in RNNs, we actually have such a circle. So we have the, the input uh, X at point T and you see that in order to calculate HD, the hidden layer, we also have, uh, we have the input XT, but we also have the previous hidden state H T minus one, which is uh, again, uh, forward to H T plus one and so on and so forth. Okay. And this architecture is very flexible. Uh, it does have some issues, for example, exploding gradient or vanishing gradient. And they stem from the way numbers are represented uh, in any computer system. I don't want to dive too deep into this, but basically uh, exploding gradient is when uh, the numbers get uh, very big, then you're multiplying very big numbers and it gets close to infinity. And vanishing gradient is the opposite problem. So if in exploding gradient, we have an overflow, a numeric overflow, in a vanishing gradient, we have an underflow, which means we are multiplying uh, numbers which are very close to zero. So um, to handle this problem, uh, people invented such an activation function, which is called GRALU, rectified linear unit. And as you can see, it's very simple. It basically says that if a number is negative, we'll make it zero.
And another solution was a more advanced RNN model called long short term memory. And there you have different gates, like an input gate and an output gate, and even a forget gate sometimes. And basically, you have more parameters, you're more, uh, gives you more control over the gradients. And there is a very nice uh, blog post by Andre Karpati, uh, which is currently at OpenAI. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, eight years ago, and it was written eight years ago. And um, basically, it's very nice because it uh, illustrates the expressive power of uh, recurrent neural networks. His main argument is what while uh, multilevel perceptrons have a fixed size, uh, input and output, the current neural networks gave you the freedom of variable uh, lengths. Let's demonstrate this. Uh, so just, um, so just uh, here for our terminology, the red ones will be the inputs, the gr uh, gr uh, green ones will be the hidden layers, the RNN, and the light blue ones will be the output, okay? So the first case is one-to-one. -one. I have uh, one image or maybe one word that I would like to classify, okay? I have then one input and one output. Uh, in the more interesting case, I have an image description. I have one input. Uh, we, yes, we consider image as one input and we consider text as some sequence of different words or letters. Um, and then we, we can uh, basically output the sentence which is describing, uh, describing this uh, image. For example, we, if we see an image of a dog, we can see a description, uh, uh, a, a dog outside the house uh, uh, with, a, with a green grass or something like this. And this sentence, the description of the image, we consider it as a sequence. Uh, an inter and the opposite case is when we have many inputs and one output, okay? So for, for example, uh, if we consider a sentence which is made of a sequence of tokens uh, and we want to give it some label, whether it's, for example, for sentiment analysis, is it positive, is it neutral, is it negative, or maybe want uh, to classify it, uh, for example, some news item, whether it's uh, finance or politics or something else, to also give it some label, basically text uh, classification tasks. Uh, the next case is many to many, okay? And uh, it, uh, here we have uh, three inputs and three outputs. Of course, it doesn't have to be aligned. For example, uh, um, I don't know. Uh, my name is Demit and uh, uh, has four words and uh, um, uh, je m'appelle Demid in French would be three. Uh, yes, the M and appelle go together. Okay, so it doesn't have to be exactly the same. And uh, we also have a case where we do want it to be al aligned for the, which means for each input, we have one output. Uh, for example, if we want to uh, label each word with its part of speech or named entities, uh, things like that. Uh, maybe someone has another example. So for example, an interesting task in NLP, uh, which can be used uh, for later task is chunking, noun chunking. We want to connect similar nouns together. Okay, so in this uh, very uh, same block. Uh, is it a good yes? time uh, to, ask, to ask a couple of questions? Uh, yeah, let me just uh, finish the slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in this very same blog post, he defines a, a three-layer uh, recurrent neural network at the character level. And then we can generate it uh, again, Shakespeare. And if uh, maybe someone wants to, would like to read it. Uh, 
Come here, uh, this time I can help you out if you like. Uh, feel free, please do. Okay, um, from Pandarus. Alas, I think he shall become approached and the day when little strain would be attained into being never fed. And who is but a chain and subjects of his death? I should not sleep. Second Senator. They are away this miseries produced upon my soul, breaking and strongly should be buried when I perish the earth and thoughts of many states. Oh, thank you. That, that was beautiful. Did, did it sound Shakespearean to you? A little. Of course, it didn't make entire, it didn't completely make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that was uh, eight years ago, and uh, I guess today's models are better. <laughs> uh, yes, Danny, you wanted to ask a few questions? Yeah, thank you, thank you. So uh, these were many ideas, and we have a lot of time, so maybe it is a good time to, to recap uh, a little bit of, of what you explained, if it makes sense. So the motivating example was this uh, six, or the all the six uh, Markov chain that generated Shakespeare uh, many slides ago, right? And and then the question is why why would we do anything other than that? Just count the combinations of words and generate words this way, right? And then I think the point was that there was a need to generalize, right? that we wouldn't like to, to kind of be very much affected by the actual count of very specific combinations, but we want some way of generalizing. And that is why we looked into those multi-layer perceptrons, right? As, as one step. And then, and then to make them sequential, we turn them into those RNNs, the, the recurrent neural networks. And then you also demonstrated there are different combinations of the relationship between input and output. Is, is it a, a, a good understanding of what you explained? Uh, generally, yes. Uh, I'd like to say in general that uh, the multilevel perceptron and recurrent neural networks were not just uh, uh, developed for generative uh, tests, but also for discriminative uh, tasks, for example, classification, um, machine translation, oh, machine translation could be generative, I guess, uh, and many other tasks, even for uh, images. So it was developed, uh, the whole AI field was developed by uh, people uh, devising uh, uh, bigger data sets and uh, benchmarks. And of course, this explosion in computing power due to NVIDIA's GPUs, which were originally for uh, playing games. Uh, but they uh, proved to be very useful for multiplying matrices and convolutions. So the, the, the whole field was marching forward and people uh, were always trying uh, um, to make better models and advance the field. And yes, yeah, so uh, these Markov models have, uh, have a few uh, short uh, comes. And one of them is they just, uh, like you said, first of all, they don't generalize and be uh, computationally expensive once you go to higher orders. And, and if you go to a higher order, you have problem of sparsity, right? You won't probably meet many cases where you have uh, a string of six, seven uh, words. Some of them will be very rare. And we we're looking for better models and better ways to generalize and uh, um, basically have some natural language uh, interfaces like we have today with uh, uh, ChatGPT where we could ask questions freely or generate uh, a sequence in a certain style. Um, so it was far from solved or I think it was a very cool start uh giving the time frame at least okay uh did i answer your question yeah thank you yes okay so let's talk a bit about mass 
And uh, which actually, probably your question, Danny, sometimes we would like to have not the most probable uh, uh, string uh, token, but we would like to uh, sample from our distribution. So to facilitate that, let's talk about softmax. So I guess you're all familiar with the max function, just giving a list, uh, list of numbers, return the max element. And we also have rmax, which basically returns not the element itself, but rather its position, its index in, in the list or array or vector, whatever you want to call it. And we also have softmax or soft argmax, which basically means don't return the, exactly the index of the element, but give me some distribution, right? Uh, uh, we are Bayesian, we like, <laughs> at least some of us, uh, we like distributions, so at least of just giving me a point estimate, just give me a distribution, okay? How is it implemented? We're basically just taking the exponent and doing some normalization by dividing each element by the sum of the other elements. It was the explanation, explanation, of course. And here is a simple implementation. Okay. So we are giving just uh, numbers one, two, three. And here the result is some probability distribution, right? It sums to one. So we can use it, uh, for example, if we have some problem which uh, we need a multi-class classification problem. We need to have an image. We need to decide whether it's a dog or a cat. Uh, sentiment analysis, we, need, uh, we can decide whether the sentiment in the sentence is negative, neutral, or positive. Um, we'd like to generate the next token uh, among uh, all the tokens in our uh, vocabulary and so on. Um, so some of us would like to level the play field and make these probabilities closer to each other. So we have here's a simple implementation. Just take a parameter called temperature and multiply the vector by the reciprocal of the temperature. And could someone tell me how would this parameter uh, affect our result? So by default, the temperature is one, right? And then it does uh, nothing, right? But right. it pass a huge number, a huge temperature, then it would turn vector into something closer to zero, right? Exactly. And then when we compute the exponent, then it, it will become closer to, to uniform uniform probabilities, probabilities which are similar to each other. But it is not obvious. It needs some explanation about why the exponent behaves this way. Yes. Right? So uh, huge temperature would result in almost even probabilities. Right? Right. So uh, yes, yeah, so you're absolutely right. We want to uh, make uh, the probabilities closer to each other. And here's some example. Uh, we have a temperature of two and a temperature of uh, a half. And you see, this is the default with a temperature of one, uh, temperature of, of, of five, uh, you see the highest probability was, which was 0.66 became 0.60. And <clears throat> on the other hand, if we give uh, a lower temperature, which is uh, one half, it, uh, it became even higher. Okay, it became 0.84. Okay, we'll see uh, why it would prove useful. So uh, let's continue our journey in time. And in, uh, I haven't talked about embeddings, but it's a very interesting topic. Basically, our input is just text, letters, and words. 
and we need to convert them to vectors somehow. So uh, there were different meta methods like uh, a bag of words, basically where we count uh, each word that appears uh, in the sentence and later a TF IDF, which should prove the very, uh, which stands for term frequency, inverse document frequency. And it proved very valuable, uh, for example, for uh, topic classification. If we have some corpus of uh, news items, we could classify it to whether it's uh, weather, politics, uh, business, uh, sports, or whatever. Um, then were some interesting works, for example, CTC, which was used in current neural networks. And in 2012, uh, AlexNet uh, was released. It uh, was a CNN, a convolutional neural network. And I think it actually uh, began our decade, such a, such a golden era for mach machine learning and deep learning because they showed the very remarkable results on the ImageNet competition. And it was uh, much better than the other models and, models, and it was a convolutional neural network, which proved uh, how valuable the GPUs were and the architecture and this whole, uh, this whole methodology of deep learning. Uh, one year later, in 2013, uh, uh, a group at Google uh, uh, proposed another uh, method to um, to derive uh, dense word embeddings, uh, which is called word vac. Basically, they proposed two models. One, uh, uh, given some context, uh, uh, you, you could guess the word. For example, if we mask one of the words in the middle of the sentence, uh, like we were doing in English class, or we had to uh, fill in these uh, gaps in our closed exams. So you could uh, use uh, this method uh, to um, basically uh, compute dense vectors for every, for every word. Uh, and, uh, and, on the, uh, and the opposite also works. For example, if you're given a word, you can uh, basically uh, guess the, uh, the context, the surrounding words, and then derive the embeddings from there. That was considered a seminal paper and um, worked very well. It did have some drawbacks in the sense that it only um, it, 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 uh, the embeddings were called uh, static, which means, for example, uh, let's take the word bank. The word bank has uh, two senses, one of this financial institution and the other a bank of a river. But if you're using uh, methods like word vac or uh, later glove, uh, you would get the same embedding, the same vector for this word, regardless uh, of its use in the sentence. We'll see later how, uh, uh, how other models uh, tackle this problem. In 2014, uh, we have an uh, interesting paper, which is a very simple uh, method to prevent uh, overfitting. Um, would, would sound like to uh, explain us what overfitting is? Uh, so, so basically, overfitting is just uh, when uh, we have some training data and our model uh, learned uh, the training data and the distribution very well, too well, too good to be true. Because it learned certain uh, statistical properties, certain correlations uh, in the training data, which are not necessarily true for our uh, real world data. So, um, because we don't want a neural network to overfit, we use uh, certain tricks, for example, a uh, dropout, or we simply uh, drop elements. Let's see an example. Okay. So here's a, a very simple example. We are giving some probability of dropout rate. And we, we are taking, a, we, are, we are given a vector uh, that would be X. And we just, uh, Randomly select, uh, for example, if the drop rate is uh, 0.2, we just uh, randomly drop 20% uh, of the values at x, make them zeros. Okay, so we use uh, this random mask and then uh, multiply the uh, vector by the mask, and then we uh, divide by the 
uh, reciprocal. And the reason we do that is uh, that we still uh, like uh, to have uh, to uh, basically to redistribute this probability mask among the remaining elements, the ones were, which were not zeroed out. Okay, here's a simple example. We have a vector of one to five and drop right 0.2 and we just randomly uh, uh, zero the third element. Okay. Uh, next, we have the paper we were all waiting for. Uh, attention is all you need. Uh, uh, a paper by Google, where they basically uh, show this new uh, architecture, which was, wasn't a convolutional neural network, nor a recurrent one, but a new architecture called the transformer. And they uh, used it uh, for uh, machine translation tasks. And as we say, <laughs> the, the rest is history. Then the GPT came and uh, BERT and GPT-2 and uh, recently chat GPT. So uh, any questions before I continue? Uh, maybe could you uh, maybe connect what you said about embeddings to the other parts of the story? Um, so the role of embeddings in in this use case we're talking about is a way to generate inputs from text to inputs to our network. Is that right? Exactly. So we begin with some raw text, uh, tokens, characters, and somehow we need to automatically transform it into vectors, right? So because our uh, models are basically just uh, math, right? They don't have this concept of a word, of a phoneme or a morpheme or, uh, uh, I don't know, part of speech. They just need uh, to be fed with numbers, right? So that's the role of embedding. And uh, previously, I said that models like WordVac produced static embeddings. So uh, a word would be given an embedding regardless of its context and its uh, sense. But uh, these newer models, <clears throat> starting actually with Elmo, which was uh, also, I think, 2019, they actually um, managed to give uh, dynamic embeddings which means uh, contextualized embeddings. And so if you have a, a sentence like, uh, uh, I went to the bank to ask for a mortgage, the word bank would have one embedding. And if in a sentence like I was standing on the left bank on the, of the river, you would have another embedding. So let's uh, talk about this revolution, uh, transformer. So it's a very nice blog post by Jay Alamir, which is called the Illustrated Transformer. This is the original uh, paper from uh, 2017, attention is all you need. And as I said, they use it for uh, machine uh, translation. So we'll just uh, recap. I won't go over, oh, I won't go over everything in this uh, blog post, but it's a very recommended reading. Uh, so just to have us uh, a bird's eye view of this uh, platform, if we treat it as a black box, we have this input, uh, just be to young, uh, and the tr translation from French is I'm a student. And uh, it basically has two blocks uh, and encoders and the decoders. And so we start with the input, we compute the embeddings. Uh, the train model has actually a matrix of embeddings for each uh, word or more precisely a token because uh, there is a very interesting algorithm which we won't go over today. But it basically divides a word to subwords to such subword tokens. And for each token, it, uh, it uh, has a different embedding. And then it goes through uh, 
another phase of embedding, which depends on the, uh, on the position of the word in the sentence. So we have, for example, an embedding uh, for, uh, for the first word, the second word, and so on. Okay. So as you can see here, uh, we are going, uh, we're starting with the text and computing the embedding. Then it passes through each encoder block, goes up the stack. And from the top encoder, we have connections to every decoder block. Okay, so let's uh, see what's inside the box. Um, in the inside the decoder, we have self-intention and then a feed forward. The feed forward is just MLP. And we'll see what uh, attention means shortly. MLP uh, is multi-layer perceptron, as you explained, right? Exactly, exactly. Thanks. It's, it's almost a synonym of feed forward. Um, it's just a matter of terminology. Feed forward means everything is going forward. There are no circles, as opposed to, for example, uh, a recurrent neural networks like we've seen. And the decoder um, also has this self attention in feed forward. And in the middle, it also has this uh, layer of encoder decoder attention. As if you remember earlier, we have each decoder has access uh, uh, to, to the outputs of the also the previous uh, decoder and also the last uh, coder layer. And uh, later we'll see uh, this layer uh, can be skipped. But uh, just to give you um, just to give you a little example, um, first of all, let's talk about. Uh, Attention. What is attention? So, um, as we know, as, we, as humans, as we are reading something or listening to something, we pay attention not to the whole text, but actually to certain words, which we pay more attention to. And so this is the intuition behind the attention concept. Uh, we would like to give uh, certain words uh, a bigger weight, a uh, bigger importance. And so uh, that's why I use this mechanism, okay? Uh, okay, so inside the encoder block, we have the self-intention layer. Uh, we're beginning with X, which is the uh, embedding. Then we have the self-intention layer. Then we just have a, an MLP, feed forward uh, network. But then we are, uh, uh, the result, R1, is basically fed to the next layer. So uh, here we have a nice uh, visualization of the intention mechanism. Um, for example, for this uh, sentence, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. We see that uh, the words uh, that an animal are, uh, I'm sorry, um, we see the word it uh, attends to the words uh, that an animal, which makes perfect sense. So we have this heat map. Uh, where we see uh, which which words or more precisely which tokens does uh, this word attend to. So uh, tired is not very interesting because not very interesting, but the animal is very interesting and very relevant for us. This is the basic concept behind the attention. So, uh, so uh, can I ask you? Um, yes, of course. Uh, so what we just saw this uh, image or with the words and lines it somehow corresponds to certain values we have inside our network in an intermediate layer which computes something that we call attention these uh, colored lines appear as numbers is is that right and yes uh, and the thicker the, the darker lines correspond to bigger numbers somewhere inside that layer which tries to compute attention. Is, is it correct? Exactly, exactly. It's basically a heat map. The darker ones means the attention score was higher. Basically just uh, we take every pair of words or tokens and we compute uh, we compute uh, their attention scores. And uh, in this talk, I haven't talked about this whole process of tokenization and how we divide this uh, the word to sub uh, word tokens, but you can see here, for example, that uh, tired was split to tire and D, 
and didn't was split. Uh, so it's not exactly a word. But yes, you're absolutely right. We have this is basically a heat map of the attention scores. So let's talk about self attention in detail. And you, maybe you've heard uh, a lot of buzzwords, but uh, I'm going to reveal you a little secret that basically uh, everything is just matrix multiplications. Okay. Okay. So during the training process, we basically uh, have three matrices. Uh, the, uh, the query, uh, the keys, and the values. Now, these are abstractions, but the way I like to think about them, just for example, you have some uh, array and an index. So um, the query is your input and the keys are the indices and the values is the array. So you, for example, you could say uh, the element in the zeros place in the first place and the second place and so on, okay? So basically, uh, there's this uh, uh, array is our values, and we could, uh, using the attention, we could say uh, which keys from uh, from the values from the array we need to retrieve, which keys, uh, which elements we would like to attend to, basically. Okay, so that's uh, the abstraction that works for me, uh, met a metaphor that works for me, and. Uh, and the way it works, uh, basically during the training process, we have these three matrices, uh, uh, Q for uh, query, uh, K for keys, W for values. Uh, values. And once we have uh, our input, for example, here we have the sentence thinking machines. So we take for each element uh, the embedding and we multiply it first uh, by WQ, the keys, uh, matrix and we get Q1 and for the second word Q2. And, and then uh, we continue uh, the, the process by uh, uh, also multiplying it um, with the keys and uh, the values and we get the values you see here, right? It's like a table, of, uh, like a multiplication table. And once we have that, we are just simply multiplying Q1 by K1, uh, doing some uh, normalization. And finally, apply our softmax uh, function to give us basically a distribution, probability distribution over the values, such that uh, all the numbers will sum to one, exactly like we saw before. Okay. And finally, we given this uh, distribution, we multiply it by the values themselves. And uh, basically, that's it. There are many details, of course, uh, which I haven't covered here, but you're more than welcome uh, to read the blog post and also the original paper. Um, I would like to say that the GPT uh, is a bit different. First of all, that it doesn't have any encoders, it's decoder only. And BERT, for example, is the opposite. It's actually encoder only. But uh, you can actually mix and match. You can, uh, both of them can be used for discriminative tasks and also for generative tasks. There's actually a nice paper, which I haven't uh, put here, but which does such uh, mix and match. It takes uh, the encoder blocks for a model called Roberta and uh, the decoder uh, weights from GPT and actually gets a uh, state-of-the-art results. So here, here is the, the full picture of the original transformer model. Okay, so finally we have this linear layer after the decoder and softmax. And basically we get just a distribution uh, as you remember, in the original transform paper was uh, dealing with machine translation. So for each word, for example, uh, if we have, uh, if we start from French and we have the word je, uh, so we have expect to have some distribution over all of our, uh, all, uh, all the words in our vocabulary, in our English vocabulary, but we expect the word I to have the biggest probability. 
and uh, SWE would be, would, we would expect the M to have the greatest probability and so on. Okay, and then étudiant would expect student to have the large probability and so on. Okay, I hope I was pronouncing the, the French uh, properly. Okay, a any French speakers here? No, okay. Uh, by the way, Dimit, uh, we have 10 minutes to the official time. Uh, so maybe it, it would be good to, to start concluding soon so that we have some time for discussion. Yes, uh, thank you, Danny. Um, so that's my last slide, actually. Um, so first of all, uh, I, I hope I managed to convince you that this is a uh, generative AI. It's not uh, very new actually has a very interesting history. And, um, and that uh, basically generating is harder than just discriminating. If I just, just train a model that would tell me the sentiments of a sentence, it's an uh, easier task than actually uh, understanding the distribution and how to generate sentences myself. And that uh, all these new uh, state-of-the-art models like GPT-3 and now GPT-4, quite similar, at least in their inference uh, to the older ones, like uh, GPT-1 and GPT and GPT-2. And maybe the most important, don't be afraid of buzzwords like AI and generative and self-attention, whatever. Basically, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's just math and pay attention. So I'll just uh, show you a little live demo, how to work with the Hugging Face Transformers implementation. One second. Uh, can you see the screen? We can see the slide. The slide, okay, let's let me try again. Okay, so first we can, install, uh, can you see it now? Yes. Excellent. Uh, so first we'll install transformers package, Python package. Uh, I'm sorry, it's Python, not closure, uh, but it's uh, kind of the lingua franca of the NLP world. And we load here a tokenizer uh, for GPT-2 and also a trained model. Here we have some uh, input text, which are talk uh, from a toddler song. Baby shark, baby shark, where are you? And we're encoding it. Encoding basically means uh, we're transforming it from words uh, to vectors, right? Um, I'm sorry, not to vectors. We're uh, basically giving each, uh, uh, each token here a, a specific number. This is such an index in our vocabulary. That would be the tokenizer. So these numbers. And, um... If I understand correctly, they are related to the word that appears in the text and to the position. Is that right? No, no, we're not talking about embeddings. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll demonstrate a bit what the tokenizer does. Uh, oh, so at the moment, it is, it is just a one to one uh, correspondence between words to numbers? Yes, but not exactly words. That's the. Okay. Um, let's try something like this, don't you think? Uh, okay, so here uh, you see that these are just, um, just each token is a word, but here let's use the word don't. And I hope the tokenizer will split it into uh, actually two different tokens, okay? Let's see what happens. Yes, okay, so we see a sub word uh, don and then apostrophe t. Okay, so that's the job of the tokenizer, basically uh, taking uh, 
and taking uh, a text with words and separating to subwords. It's an interesting algorithm called uh, BPE, uh, but we won't discuss it currently, but it's a very clever uh, uh, trick. Uh, here we can see the model, all the layers, the first uh, regular embeddings of the, each word of the position. So we can, for each uh, position of the, of the word in the text, starting from, uh, from the zeros to uh, 1023, we have a different embedding. Basically, we just sum these uh, embeddings from here and here, and then apply the dropout. Then we start with the, with all these uh, transformer blocks. And finally, we have uh, this uh, uh, linear, which basically is an MLP. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about uh, something called temperature. So for example, uh, starting with this sentence, if I'm asking the model to uh, generate, uh, for example, uh, up to 100 uh, tokens, I might be stuck in a loop. For example, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, and so on. It's repeating itself. So to overcome this problem, we are using the temperature. It's basically the same idea that we've seen in the slides. Uh, a higher number means uh, telling the model to be more creative and uh, a lower number means telling the model to be more conservative. And after applying a temperature and a few other tricks like top K, which has take the top uh, 50 most probable tokens and top P, which uh, I won't uh, discuss now, then we are out of this uh, vicious cycle, then it's generating other words. And you can uh, actually uh, use something simpler, which is called the transformers pipeline. Um, so that's it basically. I just wanted to show you the OpenAI documentation. Uh, yes. Uh, so this is uh, from the uh, OpenAI's uh, GPT models and uh, specifically chat completion. Like it's basically the same model uh, that you uh, use uh, behind the scenes in chat GPT. So it and, is uh, not the model we just saw, right? Right, we, we, we saw basically, I showed you on GPT-2 because it was the last open source model when OpenAI was still open. <laughs> and uh, since then GPT-3 and GPT-4 are all, uh, closed source. And, we don't have any visibility, but the inference is pretty similar. The training process is quite different, but the inference is quite similar. That's why I used it for inference, GPT-2. And But you can see that we, we do have some similarity, for example, the temperature and top P and top K. So it's quite useful to understand how these models works, even if you just use it as a black box API. Um, so that would be it. Um, maybe someone has questions. Thank you so much, Dimit. Um, many questions. And now we are around the official time. So maybe in a moment, a few people may need to leave and a few people, people may wish to stay. And um, so enlightening. Um, yeah, so, so uh, can, can we... Can we go back to this slide with the attention and the and the words? Is it is it okay? Um, yeah, thank you. And yeah, and maybe maybe we can go back to the the one with the thick lines between the words because I I think maybe that is, if I understand correctly, that is maybe the kind of the core idea of of these models compared to others that we have this idea of of attention. And uh, this one, um, yeah, actually this one too. That maybe that is where transformer architectures are different from many other common architectures in that we have multiplication, right? That we actually multiply 
elements, you know, values inside our network as a way of eventually of computing those probabilities of attention. So after we apply softmax, these multiplications turn into probabilities, right? And these have this interpretation or attention between parts of the system. Is that right? Yeah, well, I think there are certain innovation, uh, several innovations here. The first one being that uh, it's self-attention, which means uh, between our uh, words and themselves. Usually it was between uh, decoder and coder, uh, like we saw in the original transformer model, uh, but they also added the, the self-attention. And there's another part which I skipped, which is called the uh, multi-head attention, which basically means we are not just uh, having uh, one uh, matrices of weights for query and uh, keys and values, but we have se uh, several such matrices and each one is called the head. So basically these multiplications are not by one matrix, but several ones, and we could parallelize those computations. So uh, we, it's, it's, it could be more, uh, uh, it could be more performant, for example, RNN, but uh, eventually it's still, uh, it's still we have uh, an, uh, an order of uh, N square, where N is the size of the input. So it's not very efficient, like, uh, yeah, like a big O notation of N square. And in this sense, the tension mechanism is a bit uh, like a brute force algorithm which means it, it's not intelligently uh, pick, intelligent picking which words to attend to, but basically computes these attention scores between every pair of words. And there are some uh, newer works which I haven't covered here, which try to replace this attention mechanism, at least partially, with uh, other uh, mechanisms like uh, convolution and basically try to make it more performant, uh, actually more uh, intelligent in uh, this sense. Where, for example, there are interesting works from the from Sanford in this regard. Yeah, thank you. And then the interpretation you suggested of these this attention, the, the intuition of what it might mean was in that slide with the tokens and the lines between the tokens, where a certain token has attention, has higher attention to certain other tokens, this one, right? But actually, mm -hmm. actually, you know, what you're presenting here as, as this relationship between tokens, or rather the embeddings of tokens, right? And this happens in many parts of the system, not just with directly with tokens, but actually with other layers of the system, which correspond not to tokens, but other layers of abstract representation of the whole text. Is that right? Uh, definitely right. You're right. But I think the metaphor still stands in, in the sense that these uh, later layers of the system are evolutions of uh, the, the initial embeddings, right? For, uh, the initial embeddings are fed to the first uh, uh, attention layer for the uh, and, uh, block. And then uh, you have several such blocks and each block is uh, getting as input the output of the previous one. So in that sense, you're right. But I think uh, the metaphor is still useful. For example, uh, you can see here that uh, it's, it's still after in, we're in layer five uh, out of 12, I guess. 12 is the base uh, GPT model, the small one. There are also GPT uh, larger models of GPT, which have more than 12 layers. But even in this uh, fifth layer, you can still see that the, the token it attends to the animal, which is uh, very impressive, if you ask me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, oh, so that is the fifth layer. Yeah. Yeah. And then maybe another idea, another clever idea behind the transformer architecture that we don't didn't spend so much time with is the way things are tokenized, the way we begin with text 
and get those tokens that somehow account to positions and and maybe one day we'll spend more time with with this i guess and Dimit, thank you so much uh, we did have a session with martinas a few weeks ago where martinas talked about a few of these architectures and i'm happy that you could spend more time and add more to that previous uh, the presentation and, and get to some of the ideas between, be, behind uh, transformer architecture. And, and really, thank you so much that you could bring uh, your in-person workshop uh, to this online uh, session. And in a moment, we'll stop the recording. And Dimit, maybe if would you like to say a few concluding words to, before we say goodbye to the recording? Uh, I just hope I managed uh, to provide you some new information and maybe uh, um, break some myths and uh, misconceptions about this uh, generative AI buzzword and uh, all the hype. And uh, feel free to uh, send me suggestions and corrections or any question or anything else you'd like. Thank you so much.